Please welcome to the stage, now in his 23rd year, the president of Borough of Manhattan Community College, Dr. Antonio Perez. Thank you. We are delighted to have the New York Times popular culturally significant conversation series, Time Talks, here at BMCC. As some of you may know, the Tribeca TPAC is part of BMCC and is the longest operating performance venue in Lower Manhattan. We reach audiences from all over the tri-state as well as the BMCC community by presenting high quality music, theater, dance, and more. We look forward to your return in support of upcoming events that take place here at the college. But let me just share with you a second who we are. Lower Manhattan Community College, the largest undergraduate institution of higher education in New York City with over 27,000 students that come to us from 150 different countries and speak over 100 different languages. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to, for those of you who are new here, to a, a culturally diverse institution that serves ever striving young people who want a better future for themselves and help you return and become a part of our community. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Gray, the Director of Programming for the New York Times Live Conversation Performance and Screening Series, Times Talks, which pairs New York Times journalists with the brightest and boldest creative minds from the fields of film, theater, music, art, fashion, literature, and science. Tonight, I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's event with the legendary Oscar, BAFTA, and Golden Globe winning, winning actress, Dame Judi Dench. One of the most beloved and prolific actors of our time, Dench has once again reprised her role as British royalty in her upcoming film, Victoria and Abdul, about an unlikely but devoted friendship between a young Indian clerk and, a, and Queen Victoria. This evening, Jens, uh, Dench and New York Times contributing writer, Logan Hill, will discuss her decades-long career, her vibrant third act as an actor, and her return to playing Queen Victoria in this extraordinary untold true story. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Logan Hill and Dame Judi Jen. Nice welcome for me. <laughs> you guys are so kind. The media isn't treated with much respect normally. I really appreciate that round of applause. Um, of course, we're thrilled to have Judy Dench here today. Um, good news, if you'd like to ask her a question, uh, is that we'll have about 20 minutes at the end. Um, we'll, have, we'll take questions both from all of you here. We're going to have microphones set up on either side, uh, down at the bottom. And we'll also take questions from all the fine folks watching us and. Facebook world. Um, so please uh, leave your comments in the questions online, and in the comments on, your questions in the comments online, rather. And um, we'll try to take uh, as many as we can later on. How's New York treating you? How is New York treating me? Yeah. Is that what you said? Yeah. <laughs> How's it going? Well, we've, we've, um, we've uh, been in Venice, mm -hmm. and then we were in London. And then we were in Toronto, and now we're in New York, and tomorrow we're in Los Angeles. I don't know, I don't know, you know, I'm on a big tour. I don't know where I am. <laughs> but I've had a, we've had a very nice time. And you, and you must be used to these whirlwind trips to the city. It sounds like you, you were talking to you briefly backstage, and you said you found a little time to get over to MoMA today. We, uh, yes, I've done a lot of damage in MoMA, yes. <laughs> I hope my earrings can be seen carefully. <laughs> They're um, safety pins in my yeah. ears. Rather hoping that I'm, you know, that I'd be caught out, that I um, <laughs> suddenly put a safety pin through my ear. <laughs> it's very punk, right? It's very, does it go? Quite, with, or do you, quite, do you yes, feel like now that you have a tattoo? I do. You have to accessorize more with. Quite. Yeah. With the, mm -hmm. Yes, quite. <laughs> so this tattoo, of course, is uh, Carpe Diem, save the day, and uh, I mean, uh, seize the day. And uh, what? Um, what, what uh, you got this last year? Like I don't, I've been thinking that I'm too old to no, be I my got first it two tattoo. Years ago, two, two years actually, ago, I think. 
I got it two years ago as a complete surprise on my birthday, walking up St. Martin's Lane in London with my daughter, and she suddenly said, are you game for a tattoo now? I said, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> so we went in, um, and there, I couldn't, I couldn't possibly, it couldn't possibly be, be painful, as there was a person lying about here, having their entire leg done. <laughs> the whole leg, all the way. I thought, well, I can't complain. I mean, tiny little thing written on my wrist. But are, are you now? Comfort. Some people get their first tattoo, and it's the, the gateway tattoo. They want, no, they want not, more no, and more. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. I don't want any more. No, that's it. <laughs> I feel is it is part of it that now now that you're the very respectable Dame Judy Dench. No, that, no, no. That you want to shake that up. No, no, no you got that completely wrong. <laughs> They're very unrespectable. <laughs> Do you feel that the more awards you win, the, the, that, uh, the more typecast you get as sort of a, a figure of the theater and film and television, that you, and you need to remind people that? Um, no, I don't, no, I don't no. think that at all. Yeah. No, I think, I, think, um, I think getting awards is very good luck. Yeah. But I don't, uh, I don't necessarily think that it gets you cast more or you know, or any grander, or, you know, I just think it's good luck and yeah. how jolly nice, and then you have to get on and do the next job. Yeah. At the point you're at, I was thinking that if you or a small group of actresses, and the way the industry is now, sort of adult films being harder to make than they have been in a very long time, with the industry steering itself towards superheroes more and more, um, that it's, if an actress like you doesn't attach to a film, sometimes that film doesn't get made. Do you feel that? importance of, of saying yes to a film, the, the ability to help a film get made at this point? Well, if you don't make it, somebody else will make it. You know, it'll be done. But, um, oh, I, do, I, I don't know. I've, I just think, I think, think you're very, very lucky if you're employed. Yeah. And, and it is a, so much a question of luck. Mm -hmm. It isn't a question of... I've said this to so many young people. It isn't a question of good actors are in work. And bad actors are not in work, I'm afraid. It's not like that. It's just uh, if you're about the place and you're in the public eye and you're remi you know, they're reminded, then you may be lucky enough to get the next part. Yeah. But, I mean, I, I'm, I constantly worry. Mm -hmm. I just want to be employed. Yeah. <laughs> I want to work. What was that first... And I don't want that word, R-E-T... <laughs> I R E. <laughs> you must be sick of that question. I'm that sick of it, yeah. and I'm sick of being called a national treasure, too. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, uh, since your first role as a snail in a school yes, play. I'm glad you know about yeah, that. Yeah, I do my research. I was five. Five years old? Yeah. Did you have the, was that, did you catch the bug, as it were, then? No, 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 no. No, I behaved rather badly. Yeah. And instead of crawling across the stage as a snail, I stood up because I saw my parents. <laughs> <laughs> Waved. I heard this lady from the side, our headmistress, say, Get down, Judith! <laughs> <laughs> What, so so when, when was it? When did you know that this was something you wanted to do? Were there actresses that you idolized when you were young? No, I, I, um, I only wanted to be a, a scenic designer, stage designer. So that's what I trained. Didn't finish my training, but that's what I started to train as. Mm -hmm. um, and then I saw King Lear at Stratford-on-Avon in the 50s, and it was an incredible open set. It was like an enormous kind of popperdom the set looked, and with, a, with a, a rock in the middle that was the throne and the cave and everything. It just turned so that no curtains had to come in. It was just completely there, accessible to you, and all the, it just went, you know, it just blew me away. And I thought, I'm never going to be a, a designer like I would like to be. Hmm. I've not, not, I haven't got that imagination. Oh, wait, so I, I thought you were going to say, I, I realized then I went out because the actors were so amazing. It was not that, it was that... It was, well, the actors you, were amazing. Right, right, right. right. But, but it was more that you felt you fantastic. couldn't do that other thing. <laughs> yes. 
And so, but my brother, Jeffrey, had only ever wanted to be an actor, so I kind of got, I caught it from him, mm -hmm. like, you know, measles or one of those. <laughs> I caught it from him and that's what I, that's, then that was it. Yeah. You talk about luck. What was the first stroke of good luck? My first stroke of good luck was getting into the Central School to train. Mm -hmm. And then when I left, we did a final show and I was cast as Ophelia in Hamlet at the Old Vic. Mm -hmm. That was a pretty good stroke of luck. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the that. critics liked it much, but I had a nice time. <laughs> and I stayed there from 1957 to 61. Mm -hmm. and, and, that was, uh, and Shakespeare is my passion anyway, and that's what I did all those years. We just lost one of the greats, uh, at, uh, Peter Hall, who you worked with repeatedly. Yeah. Um, still fresh, it was you know, just about a, a week, 10 days ago, um, founder of the Royal Shakespeare Company, um, and you had the pleasure of working with him. I did. A number of times. Lots of times, 10 yeah. times, I think. Yeah. Lucky, we're, lucky. We're going to be talking about sort of teachers, uh, mentors, and Victoria and Abdul. Um, what did you learn from Peter Hall? Oh, I learned how to obey the um, how to obey the verse, because he, when he was directing, he used to stand at a lectern for the first for the first oh I don't know quite a long time, and he used to just simply look at the page so that you knew, you know, that you knew where the half lines were. And you, you know, when, when, when the line is written, then there's a half line. And then sometimes the, half, the next half line starts here, you know that that is all one line. If there's a half line and then a whole line, you know that Shakespeare intends there is something, there is a reaction of some kind at the end of the half line. Well, he taught us all that. Yeah. And so it was, it, was, uh, it was so fortunate, and I feel so lucky mm -hmm. to have learnt it from Peter and from Trevor Nunn and John Barton. Mm -hmm. Coming up in the, in the 60s in London, so much was happening at that time. Uh, I just found it. You can you find on Amazon there's a, the video, the, the film of the 1968 filming of Midsummer Night's Dream that you did with Peter Hall. Um, we have an incredible costume. Can you tell us a little bit about well, that? No, I didn't have a costume at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. In fact, my costume was picked in the morning off a tree because it was a few <laughs> ivy leaves. <laughs> and I was sprayed green and they were stuck on me in strategic <laughs> <laughs> And that was it. Just green head to toe. It's, it's really spectacular. It's, it's something. It's a strange... It, Yours it, is a loss for words. I am I at a loss for words. <laughs> <laughs> my family... My daughter constantly, I did a film, oh, well, I won't even tell you what it is in case you might look it up, but, um, <laughs> but she's always saying, I say, more soup, Inspector. <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone heard about these terrible murders in Whitechapel? I said, St stop it. I said, there's something wrong with the sound of that film. <laughs> <laughs> something wrong with the sound in that film. <laughs> <laughs> it's an old clip. We ripped it from the internet as well, yeah. Do you remember what it was like? That's a lot of pressure. Your first film improvising on screen mm. and then it working out. Do you remember? Was that a terrifying experience? It was, it was, it was quite frightening. Well, we improvised it and then he, he kind of met, he, he wrote the script from our improvisation in a way. But it didn't matter if he went slightly off the script, which was, which was glorious when we came to do it, you know. Mm -hmm. It was Norman Rodway. He was, oh, such a good actor. And we filmed it in, um, in, a, in a place in London, in Putney, where it was next to a bridge, a road bridge. It was also next to a railway. And it was next, and the planes came overhead. <laughs> and it was next to the place on the river where they used to, a boat used to come up and all the waste used to go over like that. <laughs> and Joe Melia was in the film as well. And every time, we couldn't do a take of more than two minutes, we couldn't. And every time one of, one of you know, every time we were interrupted, Joe Melia sang Wagon Wheels. <laughs> <laughs> so vivid. 
<laughs> I feel like that might not be a bad way to start. It seems like uh, film after that must have seemed kind of easy compared to that. Well, different. Different, right. <laughs> what was, um, I, you know, as you're coming in that, that point, what experience do you think you, you, le you remember the most of that, or those early cluster of films and, and plays that you did? Are there things, lessons you learned in those moments that, you, that echo back now when you're working? Yes, I think all the time. Yeah. I mean, I didn't, I didn't make many films uh, because I didn't, that wasn't my bag, really, because I went up for a film once and, and the director said to me, um, he said, I'm very sorry, we're not, we, we are not going to cast you, as I'm afraid, he said, you have everything wrong with your face, it, you will not, not make mm. films. So I thought, oh, well, no, you don't have to go, ah, because I was quite pleased. I thought, I'll go but straight back to the old Vic. I, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. I know more about being on stage than I know about anything else. Mm -hmm. and, I, and it was only after I did a film called Mrs. Brown, which is 20 years ago, um, <laughs> which was about Queen Victoria and her relationship with John Brown. It was only after that, which was made in 30 days for television, uh, but in actual fact, Harvey Weinstein saw it, and he said, "This, this will be." It, that's the only reason my career in films changed. Yeah, it's so interesting because I, I do think that we think of certain actors as being inevitable, right? You know, we only, we only, we know their success now, and we imagine it must have been a straight line sometimes, and it never is. Never. Right? Would you do you imagine what your career would have been like if that film hadn't? Well, I wouldn't have had a film career. Yeah, and I would have gone on hopefully in the theatre. Mm -hmm. But I have mostly done the theatre, I think. I don't know. I don't know how many films yeah. I've done, but, I, but uh, m mostly the theatre. And despite the sex, su success of film, you haven't stopped doing it. A lot of people, once things start clicking, they dial back, but you've, con you've continued to return to the theatre. Does it give you something different still than, in, than acting in a film? The theatre? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely everything. It gives me everything. Because if we do it tonight and we get it wrong, We'll have another go tomorrow night and get it right, maybe, yeah. if we're lucky, yeah. if we're lucky. Because it's the audience that makes it different. This, if we were to do a play now in front of this audience, it would be one thing, and then we would do it tomorrow, and it could be completely different. It's entirely a thing between us and you. It's an it's a exchange of things. It's how you react, and it's how... It's how that reaction makes you feel and how much of the story we're telling. Mm -hmm. and, we, and if it's not right, then we have another go. Right. But now, you know, I can't, I can't do anything now about the film. <laughs> it's just there. Right. And it'll never change. Yeah. Until they find some wonderful way of being zapping it. And suddenly, <laughs> suddenly you can do something else. Yeah, I mean, and there will be, you know, the CGI now is moving along. You could, pretty soon you can play anything you want. You play, you know, ape, man, woman, De Niro's de-aging himself. Do you ever think about CGI and what you could do with a bunch of dots on your face? I've, I've done a bit of that. Yeah? Is that when you have those blue spots yeah, and, on your and face? Yeah, and I guess now you have to use it a little bit less than you used to, but yeah. I think I have done that. Yeah. Don't ask me what kind <laughs> of I'm curious when you talked about... Uh, this person telling you that you don't have the right face for film, right? Um, I read another interview with you where you were talking about how your whole career had been an attempt uh, to keep from being pigeonholed. And, mm. and that seems to me someone telling you early on, you can't do this, you must go over there. It's just that I think, I think that often you, you're seen in something and it reminds it reminds uh, somebody of something, so they think, oh, yes, and, you, you know, I, what I dread now is getting a part like Queen Victoria, <laughs> because I don't want to do that, right. you know. I want, I want, to, I want to play um, a person who rides a unicycle and, you know, and, um, I don't know, and yeah. is able to climb up the side of a building, you know. I, mm -hmm. I don't want to play anybody in a court again, being haughty and rude to people. And <laughs> I don't want to do that now. Right. I've done that. What is your relationship to the royalty in general right now? I mean, do you feel that um, because you've been sort of one of the people reinterpreting, revi revi revising this history, 
that you have a, a different kind of responsibility? Were you interested in royalty before this, these few films? Not particularly. No. no. I think they do a fantastic job, and they didn't ask to do it. And I've, I think it must be, you know, at the very beginning of Victoria and Abdul, there's a moment where Sir Henry Ponsonby is telling her what she's going to do that day or the next day. No wonder she doesn't talk. No wonder she's sitting there with her head down. <laughs> you know, because every day is mapped out for you. Every day is a responsibility to all the people that you're going to meet, to all the people that you're going to engage with. You know, no wonder she met that young man and, you know, mm -hmm. had a really nice time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Can't blame her. You can't blame her. Uh, when you actually, why don't we we'll talk a little bit about? You've got a new film. We can talk about that some tonight. Uh, based on Shirbani Boss's book, Victoria and Abdul, the true story of the Queen's closest confidant. Um, uh, this film, directed by Stephen uh, Frears, is about the relationship between Queen Victoria and Abdul Karim, um, who arrives um, fresh from India to present her with a coin at the Royal Jubilee in 1887, and then uh, becomes her teacher, spiritual advisor and good friend. Um, we have a, a clip here. We'll give you a little taste of the film, talk more about her whole career and everything as well. But um, this clip is of uh, her co-star, Ali Fazal. Am I pronouncing that right? Ali Fazal. Fazal. I've uh, been saying Fazal until yeah. about three days ago. <laughs> <laughs> when he said, actually, it's Fazal. As a, I, you know, the story of this relationship is fascinating to me. I didn't realize that it had been hidden for so long. Basically, that her son, Bertie, destroys all records of this relationship. Yes. Um, do you want to talk, talk a little bit about uh, how that history was recovered and, and how this gives us a um, different it, view of her? It was it, because Bertie did, did destroy uh, everything that he found. And then um, Shivani went to uh, India and this was published in 2010 when they found a trunk containing some some letters uh, and, and uh, diary entries and things like that. And, uh, and because they were in Urdu, they were thought not, you know, they, they hadn't been recognized, as it were. And so that's how they found out about, about the whole relationship. It's extraordinary. They, they went to Sometimes he wrote him five letters a day. Huh. And that's not, he wasn't away, he was just down the corridor. He was... <laughs> <laughs> Probably some days the easiest way to, to converse with him, since there was it was such a controversial matter within within the, well, the royal were, family. Well, they thought, oh hello, this is all John Brown all over again. Yeah. We're all going to get this, you know, hoity-toity behaviour from her. She's all going to be telling us to go. She won't let us look at the boxes in the morning. Uh, she's going to be, and it's exactly what they did get. I mean, she, you know, she mm -hmm. suddenly, in her eighties, when she hadn't got much to look forward to, um, suddenly found this wonderful young man who she could talk to, who could teach her, and who they could laugh and be at ease and, and relax and everything together. Um, and she could tell the others just to, you know, sorry, she said, sorry, but you're not going to do what, he's going to help me, he's the secretary now, he's, you know, he, this is the, they, they were furious with her, absolutely furious. And she also took him um, to stay at the cottage in Scotland that she'd taken John Brown. Mm -hmm. And she said, Glassel Shields, she said, we'll go off there. Alone, sorry, none of you to go. They were, you know, couldn't be controlled. They were so angry. Yeah. It, it, making this film right now, given the kind of intolerance we're, we're seeing of all sorts, does it feel particularly timely for you? I do think it's timely. I do think it's very timely, and um, there, there is. A, I don't think it would have mattered what nationality he was. I think uh, she, he, she was fascinated by the the actual strangeness and the and the <laughs> um, the, the foreignness of him. Um, and but they were able to talk. I mean, what a great lesson that you you know you talk and find out about somebody. Don't look at the differences straight away. The differences may not even be there. Talk first, and then you'll find out where you meet instead of where you divide. 
And I think that's rather timely. Yeah. She ascended at 18 years old, 63 years on the throne, um, and then suddenly is learning Urdu, studying the Quran. Yes. It's an extraordinary transition. What, what, what do you think is about her that, was, that made her so curious at that time in her life? I don't know. I, th I suppose she was incredibly bored at the, by that time. <laughs> she, you know, she, she, she'd done a lot of raining. <laughs> Rain for a long time. Um, and she, her responsibilities were enormous. She was in her 80s. She was losing all her friends. They were all dying. Um, and, and this young man came into her life at a time when she needed friendship and she needed uh, a stimulus of some kind. And she was very curious and also very clever because she spoke lots of languages too. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that was awakened in her again. It's interesting, she's surrounded by formal advisors of, yeah. of all sorts, but there's something about him that, that, that opens her up in a different way. They don't just talk about the Quran and Urdu, they talk about life. Yet they do talk about life. And she, he is a spiritual teacher to her, the Munshi. Um, Something I thought of just then. I can't remember what it was I was going to say. No. Well, I was going to ask you if you've had a, a munshi of your own. Do you, do you, do you, are there people you look to that you consider well, mentors over the years? Well, there are lots of people. I mean, yeah. Peter Hall was one of them. Yeah. Um, there are lots of people. Not just in terms of the art, in terms of life. In terms yeah. of life. Peter Hall was? Well, you get, you get it from all your friends, don't yeah. you? Yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, I like to learn something new all the time, mm -hmm. if I can some kind. This is, uh, this is, uh, I learned a word in the summer which is natadephophobia. Now, does anybody here know what natadephophobia is? Do shout out if you do. <laughs> well, it's the irrational fear of being stared at by a duck. <laughs> <laughs> now, how have we got by without knowing that? <laughs> <laughs> and we're here at a college, so I'm glad you're, you're, glad you're well, here to guest lecture. something we've all learned yeah. today. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you do a word a day. Is this part of uh, routine? I don't do a word a day. No, I, try and, I, I try and do something new a day. Mm -hmm. Um, if, I, if I get, you know, I, well, it keeps you going, doesn't it? Yeah. Keeps you, um, keeps you on your toes a bit. Do you find that people underestimate you sometimes now? <laughs> underestimate me in what way? Like, um, as, as you're getting older, do you think that people sometimes don't um, uh, give you the respect maybe that you deserve? Oh, or no, no. no. Respect, I oh, know. Yeah. I don't care about that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you once said uh, that you looked for roles where you could walk a tightrope and then turn into a dragon. Yes. And, I, and I think of this scene yes. as very much. Well, I look, that. you know, I look, I look I, what I don't want now is to play another queen, and I don't want to play anyone imperious, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to play anyone with a, that kind of white hedgehog on her head. And I, don't, <laughs> you know, I, want, to, I want to play a really daft part now. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know. I don't want to do all that again. Yeah. Do you want to play someone as uh, terrifying as your character from Notes on a Scandal again? Oh, oh, no. I love playing yeah. that part. I love that part. I loved it. I'd read the book, and I, uh, I loved it. Mm -hmm. We had a real ball, and we had, we had a terrible fight in it. Kate and I had to have a terrible fight, and it was kept to last. Hmm. And they gave me a kind of thing like a turtle shell on my back because she had to smash me against the bookcase. And we did it all one day. And when we came off, she had a bottle of champagne in the wings. So you know, <laughs> this is to celebrate, we've done it. But we had, oh, I, we had a really, we had a ball doing it. Yeah. With Richard to, Eyre. To play, was that, um, that's not an opportunity that's come, come through a lot for you. Someone that, that is that powerful and strange and, and in some ways malicious. Uh, do, do you wish you could have played some, some yes. more kind of? Yeah. Oh, yes, many more like that. Yeah. 
you know, many more. I was thinking I don't that... like the way that people think, oh, that person plays that kind of part. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're about, I don't think. Yeah. I yeah. was thinking that one of the differences between sort of... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, male actors career and, 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 and women is that the, the guys get to play a lot of uh, more bad guys, more nemesis. Yeah, there are more parts and, for them too. Right. Mm -hmm. Not of so many for the women. Yeah. When you when you watch your peers that you came up with and see the kind of the male peer, peers and you see the kind of careers they have and you see the kind of roles that have been open to you and other women, uh, um, how do you like how do you imagine what the po what possibilities might have been there for you had you've been male? Well, I, you, no, I guess that's not the right way that to look is, at it. More, that's never more about, occurred to me. I yeah. just think lucky to be employed. Yeah. Really lucky to be employed. Lucky to have done so many plays of Shakespeare. Lucky to have been at the Old Vic and at the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, and then we, you know, I mean, in 1958, we came to America with the, with the Old Vic for six months tour. We all flew to New York. We had the day in New York, and then we met at, would it have been Penn Station or Grand Central? And we all got on a train and crossed America to San Francisco. We were three right. days on the train. <laughs> That's an experience that people don't have these days. Right. You know, we stopped at places like Laramie and Green River. <laughs> I'll never forget it. And then from there, we went all, I mean, all around. And, it was fantastic. What was so good about it? Well, you know, the, I'd never... I, it was right, you know, 1957, it was right across the other side of the world. I never thought I would travel like that. Yeah. I've been to Japan three times. Mm -hmm. It was it's just... And, and also to get the opportunity of doing Shakespeare in other... La in other places that know about him so well too, you know, know the plays, it's thrilling. And to get a chance to see them doing it too. Mm -hmm. To return again and again to Shakespeare, uh, do, do different plays mean more to you at different times in your life? Um, no. no. No, but I know that now, I remember seeing Gwen Frank and Davis once say, I know that now I could play um, I could play a lot of parts that I have played. I could play them much better now, <laughs> in hindsight. And now, because I've had more experience, I know I could... You know, everybody says to you, as a, as a tip, really, less is more. The less you do, the more powerful it is. You can convey... And so when I played Ophelia, I kind of tried everything to make her mad in that scene, um, but I know now that I would have only needed to do one thing, and that would have conveyed it in a much simpler, clearer way, without messing up, you know, messing all the, the verse and things. Yeah. So, in hindsight, you know, you think, oh, well, I'd like another go at that, but it's too late, can't do that anymore. <laughs> we talked about, uh... Mrs. Brown as being a turning point. Do you think there, are, and getting into school is a turning point, do you think there have been other turning points in your career when things might have gone sour or, or taken off? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I was cast in Cats and um, was about to open in it, and uh, in the original production. Huh. And then I um, snapped my Achilles tendon and so I was out of it. And then, because uh, I was playing two cats then, I was playing the Gumby cat and Grisabella, um, and uh, Trevor Nunn said to me, it doesn't matter, uh, you'll be in plaster, but you can play the Gumby cat. She kind of clapped out, oh, cat, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but I couldn't, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't do all that tap dancing with those beetles, cockroaches and things, the Gumby cat. So anyway, but then we, we transferred from the rehearsal room to the New London Theatre, and uh, there were ramps to come up onto the stage. And um, ten days before we opened, I, uh, on our first day on the set at the New London, I started to come up the ramp and fell over into the audience. Oh. And so I thought, 
I can't play this clapped out. I'm completely clapped out. I can't do it at all. <laughs> so, so that was it. Yeah, you could have been I doing that do for it. a decade. I didn't do well, it, but then I went to see it, and I thought, gosh, I'm glad I'm not in that. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't. Oh. <laughs> not because I didn't like it. I liked it, but I just thought, oh, I'd be exhausted by now. Completely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm allergic to cats myself. Oh, um, no, I like a cat. There's that line, uh, nobody understands what it's like to be queen. What, do you, what did do you think you learned from this round that you didn't understand about her before? Um, the drudgery of it, maybe. Mm -hmm. Knowing that, you, you know, that... That day to... This what I was, you know, that day-to-day -day responsibility of people expecting you to behave in a certain way, expecting you to do everything. You know, the, you know, they don't ask to do that. They're born into it. It must be ghastly. Yeah. yeah. We, um, we're going to have some time to take some questions. So I think we're going to set up some microphones um, at the end of these aisles to the left and the right. And we'll ask you to line up. We won't be passing around a mic. so. We'll ask you to check those out. And we've got some questions from our friends and watching online. Um, and I'll start with one from Lisa from Facebook, Judy, who says, uh, what part would you like to play that you haven't yet? Oh, I have no idea. Yeah. Somebody should I write know. one, write a well, good one, Where's right? this person about the person learning to walk the tightrope and <laughs> <laughs> turning into a beetle? Yeah. And we have Maria who asks, um, what's been your favorite role to play? Do you, do you have one favorite? No, Is there a favorite child? No, I don't. No, I don't have a favorite role that I played. No. Yeah. Is there a least favorite? Someone you hated? Yes, Portia and the Merchant of Venice. <laughs> Why? I don't like the play. Mm -hmm. I don't like the, yeah. They all behave very, very badly in that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really badly. After giving, giving Shylock a very hard time, then they, you know, they... I think it's an awful play. I shouldn't have done it. Um, and um, my husband, we had just, my husband and I had just been married and he played Bassanio. And this is an absolutely true story. Uh, Portia says to him, when he's choosing the caskets, I speak too long but is to pease the time, to eke it, and to draw it out in length, to stay you from election. And I said, I speak too long, but is to pease the time, to eke it, and to draw it out in length, to stay you from erection. <laughs> And the Royal Shakespeare wind band, who were on the stage, simply put down their, their instruments like that, and they just walked off. <laughs> and then I was left having to face Michael. And Michael had a very long speech. I, it was hideous, and we got reported. <laughs> That's the only thing I like about the Merchant of Venice. Yeah. <laughs> that glorious evening when it all went so wrong. <laughs> we have uh, one more from online. Deborah asks, uh, what word best describes your life to date? One Lucky. word. Lucky. Yeah. And we'll start with a question from over here, please. It's really, my name is Laura and Dame Judy you just make me so happy. I thank you for your body of work. I came with two books that I love that I'd like to give to you. One is called an anthology of books, uh, poems about loss called The Art of Losing, edited by a wonderful poet named Kevin Young. And another is the collection of Szymborska, the Polish Nobel laureate. Um, and I think you would enjoy them both. And I just, I thank you for your whole body of work. It nice. means so much. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I will say, that was really lovely. And I love Kevin Young, who's a great poet. But if we can, um, we're going to try to get in as many questions as we can. So we'll try to keep to questions if we can, please, sir. You over here. Um, 
you played Ophelia, Gertrude, and Hecuba. You've played Victoria, Elizabeth Victoria. You've worked with Gilgood, Branna, and Vin Diesel. <laughs> <laughs> As the BAFTA most promising newcomer to leading film roles of 1966, do you have a perspective on actors and their friends and collaborators aging through roles and a lifetime? Sorry, what was the end of that question? Do, um, do you want to repeat it? Do you have a perspective on, a perspective how on actors in the community of actors and creative people uh, age through a lifetime and how that's... And aging through roles. There are certain through. roles that you can no longer play mm. that you might have played with people when you were in your 20s. And didn't get the chance, you mean? Perhaps not. Perhaps not. Hmm. I mean, Charles oh, Vance has been a friend of yours for a long time. How long did it take for you to get to work on film with him? Well, maybe I'll rephrase. So, I, uh, if you don't mind, I'll, you. I'll tweak it a little bit. So, we, uh, <laughs> as a question, it's really uh, difficult. Um, because that's really interesting. I mean, you know, if if we talk about how your career has changed, and there are roles that, you know, y your window uh, moves. You know, unless unless we do CGI you in different ways, right? Um, uh, there are roles that you missed out on, on playing, probably. You know, the, the young love interest, the, the young heroine. Uh, are there, Juliet, are there roles you can't missed? get more yeah. young love interest than that, can right. you? Right. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't, I, I've never felt... I've always been... Op I, I'm very open to the, the, uh, a new... A, uh, something that I have to learn... In a new, you know, in a new, in a new way. But I've never actually. I suppose there are parts that I thought, oh, I don't actually think there are parts that I've thought, oh, I wish I would played that, or, mm -hmm. or you know, um, is that the answer to your question? <laughs> Am I answering? Is it this in a way that you would properly? just drive yourself crazy if you thought of all of the different ways of career? You think of the things that. you could have done and didn't. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm. I think. I, yes, I think that way you'd go, go mad. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but you just have to hope that maybe, maybe tomorrow I shall be asked to do something that I ha haven't done and, and, you know. Mm -hmm. we'll do a question uh, from over here, please. Uh, yes, um, I just want to bring it back uh, to India for a second. I'm a big fan of the uh, exotic uh, Marigold Hotel series. <laughs> um, and uh, one of the great scenes is everybody arriving um, in India for the first time, the reactions, being in the tuk-tuks, everything else. Um, it, was it anybody in the gang's first trip to India? Any first impressions or any funny stories? Was it anyone? Um, what, what, was it anyone's first time to India in that yes. cast? And was anyone particularly maybe out of their element? Or? It was everybody's first time in India. Huh? All you Brits, for real? And it, it was <laughs> phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. And then we had eight weeks on doing the first one. Then we were asked to go back and do eight more weeks doing the second one. And I couldn't wait to go. <laughs> we had the most glorious time. I think it's... My daughter said to me, oh, you found your spiritual home, she said to me. <laughs> and in a way, I feel I have. Uh, I just... Many, many things you have to come to terms with there. Of course, there is... Well... You know this better than I can tell you. Great, incredible poverty and incredible wealth. But they are the most beautiful people that as a, as a country. We, and I still am in touch with many people we met there. And I hope to go back sometime. Um, but it facilitated the film. Everybody worked, you know, so hard and... and we just never came up against people saying, no, 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 you can't do this, you can't do this, oh, no, you can't get there, you know. It was all very, very inclusive and made our job easy. It was glorious. Thank Hope you. we do another. Yeah. I think we won't, because Maggie's died now, so I don't think we will. Question over I've heard please. you on many stages, and it annoys me that you say, you're so grateful to be employed. You're so happy when the next job is coming forth. Now that you've reached the senior stages of your profession, have you ever thought, I'm going to create the work and do the hiring? Have you ever thought of being the boss? You mean direct? 
whether it's yes, producing or directing or creating, be in a position where you're hiring the next... No. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's not quite my scene. I can't do... No, but I have directed... Uh, I've directed Ken Branagh twice. Um, it's a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I don't... I, I then suddenly found that I didn't like... I don't like being in that position. I don't like being in the position of, of telling people what to do or having the vision to do the play a certain way. I just don't like it. And, and I suddenly about the actors kind of gang up against you. And after <laughs> rehearsal, they all go to a pub and won't tell you where they've gone. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like that. <laughs> and then, then when I did Much Ado, they all went out on tour. And I went to see it quite secretly to see what they were up to. And then afterwards, I sent a message around saying, I'm going to come and give you a few notes. Well, I can only tell you that Ken Branner left in his costume. <laughs> <laughs> Next question over here, please. Uh, two related questions. First of all, with today's counter-casting, if there were a male role that you could play that you would love to try, I'd like to know about that. And the other thing is I'd love to know about your process. How do you prepare uh, to do a role on stage and how it's different for film? Um, <clears throat> there are lots of there are lots of parts in sh in Shakespeare, for instance, men's parts that I would I just adore what they say and the language they have, but I don't want to play them. I I just don't fancy it. Um, I don't. No, I just don't want to. Play them. I don't. Want to play them. <laughs> Um, the process is, well, for a, for a play, you have a rehearsal time. And you, you, have, you, you may have four weeks or you may have five weeks. I've had six weeks of some things. Uh, so you rehearse and you learn the part and you go and you do a certain amount of work at home because otherwise you're wasting other actors' time by asking questions and things that you could actually have solved yourself at home. So you go and you rehearse together, and then you do the play. Whereas in film, uh, Stephen doesn't rehearse. People don't rehearse in a film. You have to know it, and you have to go, and they say, um, this, is, uh, this, is, uh, this is the room you're going to, or something like, no rehearsal. People are amazed about it, but there, aren't, there isn't any rehearsal. Um, and so it's up to you to prepare that inside so that you've got all the thought processes. And people say, isn't it difficult to learn a part? It, isn't, it, isn't, it is difficult to learn a part. It's much more difficult to learn why you say that line. What it is that makes you, that somebody said to you, or perhaps not said to you, whatever, that makes you say that line in the first place. That's what's difficult. Has that answered it? I think so. Uh, question on this side, please. Yes, uh, first of all, I want to say how much, uh, thank you for so many hours of enjoyment that you've given me, both um, in films and on TV. I saw your latest film a few days ago and loved it, and I still watch as time goes by. Yeah. <laughs> That's the most difficult job. Situation comedy is the most difficult thing I've ever done. Why? Because you, you, re you, read, it, you, you read it on a Tuesday morning. By Tuesday afternoon, you've set it. You rehearse Wednesday and you know it. Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And on Sunday, you have a whole audience like you and, and I'm standing in the wings, and they introduce you. That's a nightmare. <laughs> and you come on, and every single episode, I used to stand in the wings and say, how have I got myself into this position? <laughs> because you come and you say, hello, hello, hello. And then you go and do a scene, a comedy, 
that you do for the first time in front of an audience and a camera. You're very lucky if you, if you work with somebody like Jeffrey Palmer, because Jeffrey Palmer has got it to a T. He really, you're in very safe hands with him. But you know, you, 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 you are testing your comedic skills straight away. They haven't got a whole, they haven't got two days, you do it in an evening. And therefore, you know, you could do a scene a couple of times, but then I remember once I had to pick up a drink from a table and walk over to another table. I had to dr pick up a drink from a bar and walk over to another table and put it down and talk. Now, for some unknown reason, <laughs> uh, and these drinks were not in bottles, they were in, you know, they were like a lagers. In, for some unknown reason, I picked two lagers up and walked. Well, of course, you can't, you can't do that. You can't, in one hand, you can't do it. And so they said, stop the tape, stop the tape. Mm. Judy, just take the one drink. <laughs> so then I took the one drink, and after I put it down, the audience went ballistic, and they completely, they cheered, and they laughed. <laughs> well, of course, then we had to do it all over again. Because said, <laughs> the audience at home will wonder why this simple move of taking this yeah. to bear gets this enormous round of applause. Because <laughs> <laughs> of the idiot actress. <laughs> Folks, I wish we could take all the questions, but we're going to have time for two more from each side. I'm sorry, I've been trying to get as many in as we can. Uh, so next question over here, please. Hi. I, you talk about luck. I, I was lucky enough to see your Desiree Armfelt in A Little Night Music at the Olivier four times. And each time I saw it, you made different choices, found different colors every single time. I just, if you would talk a little bit about your experience working with Sondheim and on that production, it was, it was like a master class in musical theater acting. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, well, it, it's the, it's the, it's the choice you make, you know, I, I can't talk about it much. It's the, it's the, the, oh, I'm so bad at words. I, um, um, it's the, it's the gloriousness of playing something night after night after night. So then you might get somebody who comes around who might say something about it and gives you, you suddenly think, oh, I've missed out on that. Of course I should, you know, so you, you get, you get, it's the glorious fact that you get, you have a choice in the theatre. You have a choice in, in just doing something slightly different the next night. Or the way Larry Guitard played Frederick Egerman and the way that Larry said something will be slightly different one night. Therefore, you, you know, it's like, it's like a light. You, you ever so slightly change all the time. And hopefully, it gets better. Hopefully, sometimes not. <laughs> when we did Antony and Cleopatra with Peter Hall at the National, uh, uh, after we'd run, we did 100 performances of it. And after we'd run some time, he came and said, I tell you, he said something, it's got a bit Baroque. <laughs> so I, I thought, what? I don't know quite what. Well, it was just before I did much, directed Much Ado. And I went back to see a performance of Much, Much Ado, and I suddenly, in a flash, looking at it, thought, I know exactly what Peter meant. It's when you leave actors alone to get on with the play, they start adding little tiny little bits, so you know, it gets a bit kind of, and you think, no, 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 I didn't ask you to, you know. So, so it has advantages. The, the, it's just a question of react, reacting to what the other person is saying, and therefore you suddenly think, oh yes, of course, that's what that means. And that can strike you a very, very long time afterwards. As I said, we did 100 performances of Antony and Cleopatra, and I knew that on one line, Cleopatra should get a laugh. I knew that there was a laugh line that she should get, and I, and I didn't get it until the 100th performance. And that <laughs> night, the laugh, and I thought, well, at least we got that. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, question you. over here, please. Thank you. Um, you just spoke a little bit about comedy. Um, do you have any opinion on Tracy Ullman's portrayal of you in her sketch show? And since uh, you said you'd rather not play more serious roles, getting to do more comedy or perhaps that kind of comedy? Well, I've done it an enormous amount of God. I, I think Tracy Ullman is a genius. <laughs> I think she's a genius, and she's got me in quite a lot of trouble already. <laughs> I, I do carry a big bag a lot of the time on my shoulder. I went to my um, local farm shop, and I was just looking at something. And this man said to me, watch it. <laughs> 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 thank you. A question from over here, please. Uh, Ms. Dench, thank you for your time this evening, and I think I speak for everybody here in wishing you well in your future endeavors. I often ask people what they strive for in life and what they desire, and it really boils down to three things being fame, uh, money, and travels. As somebody who, in my uneducated opinion, uh, I see that you satisfy all three of those, at this stage in your life, having accomplished so much, what are the goals and what are the things you strive for for the remainder of your life? Um. <laughs> what are the things just, you just strive nice... for? Just yeah, what do you strive for? I just want to go yeah. on working. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's all I want. And, and learning those natty defophobia, don't forget it. Can you, can you, say, can you say the word again, just so we natty all... De natty defophobia. Now every, everyone together. And what is it? One, two, three. Natty, natty defophobia. defophobia. Okay. <laughs> uh, question over here, please. And uh, this will be our last question. Thank you all so much. Hi, my name's Rachel, and uh, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I was a drama student in Manchester from 1970 to 71, and I saw you in uh, the Royal Shakespeare Company, Twelfth Night, I believe Viola at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, it became a muse, and I actually used that as an audition piece for Central. I want to know from you, you said you don't have a favorite role, favorite role or particularly uh, a favorite female role, but everybody has some kind of muse. So I'd like to know from you what serves as your muse or who serves your, as your muse both in real life and in terms of the roles that you've played. What energizes you? What, what, what energizes you and what serves as your energizing. muse and serves as your muse? Is there, if you're having a bad day, is there something you look for? Is there some place you go? No, a better day. A lot of people were inspirations to me, and I suppose that's where they were muses. I mean, I was fortunate enough, as Logan said, to work with John Gielgud and Peggy Ashcroft, and they were fantastic. And they were they they taught me a lot of things. But I mean, I have so many so many people that I, you know, that I owe owe entirely my career to, because of inspiration in certain you know at a time when I probably was feeling a bit down or or need really needed it. They gave me the encouragement and 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 the and the and wanting to go on and wanting to learn something more. And characters that you played? Any characters that served as a muse? And characters? That you played. People that you, that roles played. that you played, yes. Um, well, I, um, I had to play Iris Murdoch, and she hadn't long died. I found that unbelievably difficult, because there were many, many people who knew her, and um, the responsibility, it's all right, Elizabeth I and Queen Victoria, they're all, you know, they're quite a way back. Nobody here knew them. Um, <laughs> so, but uh, many, many people knew Iris Murdoch. And, and uh, it, the responsibility of that was, was really tremendous. And I also um, um, did a film with Stephen Frears called Philomena, and that was a, a, about... That was about a lady called Philomena Lee, who I met. And, and once you've met the person, 
you know, you have a huge responsibility to them. And especially if they're still alive. Yeah. Uh, but, but it was an incredible asset meeting her because uh, she has, the, with all that extraordinary life she had, she has the most fantastic sense of humor. And I wouldn't have, if I hadn't met her, I wouldn't have known that, nor would I have played her with one. I wouldn't have known to do that. But, um, but having met her, you know, that was like somebody just opening a wonderful door just for you to walk through. Thank you. And speaking of great sense of humor, uh, this has been a blast. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. So thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you for the